Hey everyone, uh, I'm Peter. I'm going to be talking about etcd over gossip. And there's a tagline because I guess every talk these days needs to have a subtitle. Um, another title for this talk might be uh, embedding etcd in your application. Or another title for this talk might be porting etcd to a different transport. Um, this talk ultimately is going to be a, a sort of a technical deep dive into etcd internals. Uh, it tracks a project I did recently where I ported etcd to a different communication layer other than HTTP. Uh, it'll be useful if you ever want to adapt etcd for your own sort of purposes to your own project. Um, lots of code in this talk, lots of arch architecture talk, a little bit of theory too, so be warned. Okay. So let's first talk about the communication layer that I'm porting this thing to. And this is a uh, sort of a, a, it's a library or maybe you could almost consider it a product. I don't know. It's this thing called Weave Mesh. It's, uh, it's a Go project ultimately from my company, uh, Weaveworks here. Uh, it's a combination of two things. And the most important thing for this talk is that it's a gossip based communication layer. Um, and then on top of that, there's also a CRDT-based uh, data store or data layer. So the idea is you can use one or both of these components in order to help you build your own distributed application. Um, so here's kind of how it works. There's these two pieces, and they interact this way. And the idea is you might attach your application to them like this. Um, one such application that we've attached to Weave Mesh like this is WeaveNet. And maybe this is something you've heard of before. How many here like use Docker day to day, more or less? Yeah. And how many have heard of Weave? Okay, a couple. If you haven't, um, Weave is a software defined network. It's an overlay network, originally designed to work directly with Docker. Now it's kind of expanded. We have a, uh, a CNI plugin for Kubernetes. We have plugins for like DCOS, MISOS, all these things. Um, the idea is underneath WeaveNet, we use WeaveMesh, this gossip based communication layer, to find and talk to other peers. Um, we use this ERDT data bit to build a IP allocation module. Uh, we use it to do, provide DNS. Uh, the idea is you give an IP per container. It's somehow conceptually similar to Flannel or Calico or something like this, but we think it's easier to use and it uses this nice library underneath. So at the top, you get your virtual network interface, you get IP per container, you get other nice things. But that's just one example of an application you can put on the mesh. You can really put anything there. Let's get a bit more concrete with these orange boxes. What's actually happening in here is um, there's this interface, we call it the gossip data, which you need to implement if you want to use the, the data store portion of, of the library. And at the communi communication layer, there's this thing, uh, there's a couple of things. There's this thing called a router. I'll talk more about that. And then there are these two other interfaces, a receiver and a sender. Think of this as like a transmit and receive interfaces that you need to implement or invoke whenever you want to do communication. Um, in particular, the router is pretty smart, contains a lot of intelligence. Uh, it can traverse partially connected networks. It can detect when peers arrive or leave the mesh. Uh, it deals with and recovers from partitions if you have them. Uh, it uses its own CRDT data model thingy inside to keep track of this network topology, uh, topography. So let's look at it even more closely. In fact, your application, if it totally ignored the CRDT thing, it could be pretty interesting just to use this thing, right? Um, over a single physical connection that it makes to other peers on a physical network, uh, it sort of multiplexes multiple logical connections. Um, and each logical connection is something we call a channel. And each channel is kind of like a namespace, its own sort of logical network. And within that network, so here's, let's say, your, your physical network, we're going to multiplex um, the channels on top of it like this, and it's going to appear as if all your peers have perfect connectivity, even if they don't. So that's kind of neat. So here's sort of the contract between your application and the communication layer. Um, you get two interfaces, basically. Uh, Gossip receiver is sort of like a callback, and your application needs to implement this. 
And it's sort of invoked by the router whenever there's a packet for you. And Gossip Sender is something that you can use, you can invoke when you want to send things over the network. And it's a bit more complicated than this, but this is the gist of it. On Gossip is like the receive, you get where the packet came from, and then you get the packet. And then you can do a Gossip unicast to a specific destination or a Gossip broadcast to all destinations. Um, in addition, there's also this uh, peers method, there's many more methods, but there's this peer, peers method on the router that tells you who's active in the network right now, and you can also subscribe to that if you want. So if your application just hooks into the gossip part, it gets a message-oriented, partition-tolerant communication layer. Peers are auto-discovered and propagated. Partitions are managed. It's kind of nice. Um, to be concrete, this is what I want to do. Uh, I want to stick etcd on top of this thing. And in theory, it should be possible, right? And to see why it should be possible, let's take a, a, a brief uh, diversion here and let's talk about Raft. I mean, I guess we all know what Raft is. Yeah, good. You're raising your hand, that's smart. Um, let's talk quickly about it. Uh, Raft is a consensus protocol. Here's a paper. Uh, here's the author. If you have questions later, I think he's going to be giving a talk. Um, very briefly, Raft is a consensus protocol. And like all consensus protocols, what it does is give you strong consistency over sort of fallible networks, over imprecise networks, over bad networks. At a very high level, the model of Raft is propose, commit. So here's a little state diagram. Every time you interact with Raft as a client, you're asking Raft, do something, mutate a value, right? Write one, two, three to the value x. And what comes back to you is like, okay, I'll consider doing that, or this like, proposal has been accepted. And then Raft takes care of propagating this information to other uh, members of the cluster. At some point in the future, hopefully, uh, you've achieved quorum, and this value is now sort of set in this replicated log, which is the abstraction underneath. And then from that point forward, you can make a request, and you can say, what is the value of x? Okay, well, it's what you proposed it should be. What I want to point out is that in this in-between space, if you ask what the value of x is, well, it's not yet defined. Um, what I want to point out here is that Raft's concept of, of communication, of, of message pathing, is sort of packet-oriented. It's just take this message and, and, and propagate it to certain peers. The Raft protocol itself compensates for dropped and out-of-order deliveries and this sort of thing. In other words, TCP and all the guarantees it provides you isn't really required. In theory, I think UDP is enough. Is that right? Yes, good, okay. Everything hinges on that, so I'm glad to have that confirmed. Um, although I'm not aware of any UDP-based implementation, um, maybe if you know one, you can tell me after. I guess this makes sense, because if you can do UDP, I guess you can also do TCP, so there's no real reason to kind of fall back um, there's no advantage. Uh, we'll, we'll see an advantage maybe in a second. Uh, so the abstraction, what I, what I want to just point out is the abstraction for Raft is this is all that's required. You just need to be able to send a message to a destination or try to even, and uh, Raft will take care of retries and that sort of thing. Um, it's not a coincidence that this is basically the same signature as this. Okay, uh, that brings us to etcd. Uh, etcd, as we all know, it contains a pretty well-tested um, Raft implementation, and it puts on top of that this kind of powerful, um, uh, expressive API. And the point of that is that Raft by itself is just a distributed log, right? It's just propose commit, and then you can kind of build up this sequence of, of transactions. Um, etcd gives us the nice stuff we want, like key value semantics, and watches, and leases, and TTLs, and all this kind of stuff. So, it would be cool if we could leverage all that. So what is etcd? Fundamentally, I think it's just a bunch of related concerns. Like you have this core raft bit in the middle, and then you have like some sort of persistent storage, and you have uh, the persistence part of that storage, and then you have the transport where all the communication happens, and you have the API that you present to the users, and here's all you know the, the things that etcd uses for all these blocks. Um, I guess it should be possible, right? If you say like, well, I'm not really interested in persistence. Um, my cluster can be ephemeral. I can just leave that out. And, and maybe I don't want to use HTTP. I can just swap that bit out. Um, so in theory, this is possible uh, because I, these particular things aren't really mandated by Raft, the protocol. They're just kind of like implementation details in a sense. So 
This is kind of how I expected etcd to be laid out. Um, at the top, you have this nice API, whether it's the V2 or the, or the new powerful V3 API. There's some mechanical stuff in there, and then you get to like the store, the storage layer, and maybe you can bolt on uh, disk persistence to the side. And then there's some like more mechanical stuff, the proposed commit like interaction, and then below that you have the Raft Core thing, which is I hope its own library. And then Raft Core is the part that communicates with other members of the Raft network, so maybe that's where the transport sits down there. Um, so let's vote. How many think that this is how the etcd internals are laid out? Nobody. Oh, half a hand. I saw half a hand. Uh, yeah, no, sorry. It's not true. Um, so now we do our deep dive. And the goal here, remember, is we want to uh, swap out the transport. That's kind of all we're interested in. And because uh, I'm not particularly interested in stateful services, I don't care about persistence. I want to build sort of ephemeral etcd clusters, uh, strongly consistent for the lifetime of the, uh, the nodes in the, in the distributed application, and then it can all go away. That's fine. So here's etcd uh, in the GitHub. And uh, first thing we probably want to do is to look at the existing etcd server, like the, the server itself. Maybe it's a package main, maybe it's its own library, and see if we can just like swap out a transport. So here we see etcd server. It defines how etcd servers interact and store their states. Looks like what we need. Um, when I open up a new package, the way I sort of understand it is to look at the constructors. If I know what the constructors take as parameters, I know kind of the interaction points, I know what the dials are, uh, the surface area of the thing that I'm looking at. So we can look at the constructors in this package. And uh, we get new, new server. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't really see that, can you? Maybe a little bit. Um, new server takes a config object. In the config object, we see a bunch of interesting things. Um, we see dials, and all these arrows are kind of pointing to dials. Um, there's dials for URLs, like peer URLs and this sort of thing, client URLs. There's dials for storage details, like um, uh, let's see exactly what, like where to put the, the wall file on the disk. And this isn't really encouraging because it means that I, if I want to use this, I'm going to have to fake all this stuff. And I'm guessing that these things aren't going to take nicely to being faked because they're real URLs and real paths to the disk. OK. Uh, we can dig a little bit deeper, and we can see that the etcd server uh, struct contains, well, you can't see. You'll have to take my word for it. Um, contains this thing called a raft.node. Oh, sorry, a raft node. And it's kind of like a, a controller or a manager component that wraps the raft implementation. And in there, we see. Uh, this one thing down here at the bottom, it's called the transport, and it's a raft HTTP dot transporter. Hmm, not great. Um, that's not really swappable. If we want to swap that out, it's, there, there's no like hook for that. Uh, so we're going to need to, it seems to me, re-implement this at CD server, which is more work than I wanted to do. OK, um, let's look at that. Let's look at the kernel of the thing, which is this raft.node. And here we have a bit of good news. Uh, package raft starts with this lovely little block of text that explains, uh, quote, how to build and, and sort of, uh, I'm not sure that's a quote. It explains how to build and care for this node object. Um, so there's like four steps. Um, you have to write some state. You have to read a certain channel. You have to process some stuff, and then you have to advance the internal state machine. Um, that's cool. It also gives us this little pseudocode thing on the side here, which sort of is like a, the bare minimum uh, uh, driver loop that you need to uh, drive one of these nodes. So uh, that's great. And there's even a link to a little example program. So here's that example program. Uh, this is like the bare minimum kind of example program, and it's intended as, I guess, a tutorial. Uh, here's the entire funk main, which is really nice. It's about 20 lines, I guess. Um, and this is pretty close to what I'd expect to see. As ever with learning new code, for me, the key is in the constructor. So we look at this uh, new raft node, it's sort of like the, the meaty line of the whole thing. And presumably, that's building this controller object. So let's look in there. Um, here's the controller object in the example code. Um, it's analogous to the struct that we saw earlier in the actual etcd program. And we see the raft node that it's driving right there. That's a big arrow. And then everything else is just kind of the mechanical stuff you need to, to do your job here. 
Um, there's some stuff we don't want, like this wall deer and a few other things, but we're going to be re-implementing this, so it's kind of fine. Um, we can figure out alternatives as we go. Let's take a look up at the top here. These two channels, uh, propose C and conf change C, they're annotated as receive only, which means we can only ever read from them, which means that they're providing inputs to us. That's great. That helps me fix things in my head. Um, these two channels seem to be the same ones that are returned by the constructor, which strongly implies they're used to send information to the uh, calling context. Um, in other words, they're providing output from our controller. It would have been great if they were annotated as send only. Oh well. Uh, there's some mechanical stuff in the middle, and here we come to the other sort of interesting handles, the other in interesting references. We have a uh, memory storage, we have the wall deer stuff, the persistence stuff again and then the raft HTTP transport. Uh, again, not ideal, but this is an example we're re-implementing, so there at least appears to be a single point of like, interaction for all these things, and that's, that's good. Okay, so let's give it a shot. We can build our own etcd server, um, kind of from first principles, unfortunately, uh, and we're gonna start at the center. We're gonna start at this raft node, and we're gonna build up what we need around it. I guess that's what we have to do. So here's our raft node driver, and here's kind of how I model it. Um, in the middle you have the raft node, and you need to provide it some input, so these are these two channels that we know about. Um, proposed entries and proposed configuration changes. And just quickly, a configuration change is some kind of um, request into the raft node that says, hey, your cluster membership is changing. Whether a, a, a node's leaving or joining, it's some different kind of uh, change than just a regular like write. Okay. Um, similarly, it provides output. In the example, we had a sort of output of a uh, stream of commits and then some kind of error output. And then there's these other things, a storage layer, a persistence layer, and then the transport at the bottom. So there's a couple ways to model this kind of architecture in Go, and at first, um, I tried to keep with general Go best practice, which is avoid putting channels in your API. And I tried to model all these things as interfaces. So a proposer would be something that can do these two things, and a commit receiver is something that can receive commits, and blah, blah, blah. But that means that when you build your kind of program up, you have to do this weird form of dependency injection, and you get kind of like these invalid intermediate states. And it's not so nice. Um, I think the right way to think about this is to realize that what we're building is something that is actually like message passing. And so channels here do kind of make sense as a first order thing. So I model all these things as, as chans of entries and errors and this sort of stuff. And it seems, to, it seems to make sense. Okay, so that means our funk main kind of looks like this. We're building these channels first, and then we're hooking all these components onto the channels as necessary. Um, we're sort of building the infrastructure as dumb plumbing, just like dumb channels and pipes, and then we're connecting the smart components to it. Makes sense. Okay, so now look, let's look at the internals of the uh, new raft node driver. Now let's look at the struct that we saw in a couple of places. Um, here's our struct. So far we have the raft node we're driving. We have our plumbing. We have the channels. I've annotated them. Uh, we're probably going to need some references to some other stuff, and then we have a, a thing that tells us when to quit. Okay, so let's go back to the example program. That's cool. Uh, here's an excerpt from the main loop. Here are the places where we're interacting with the raft node. Um, the first one is just advancing the clock, which you have to do every 100, 200 milliseconds or something like this. It's fine, pretty easy. The second one, uh, we're reading from this ready chan. We're processing it somehow, and then we advance the state machine. Uh, and I've highlighted all the points where we interact with the raft node. Okay, this is uh, actually, remember this? This is the documentation from, uh, the sort of pseudocode driver from the documentation. And we see it's pretty symmetrical, which gives me hope. Looks good, good sign. Let's take a look, closer look at the transport bit because that's what we're interested in. Uh, the transport, remember this is our weave mesh. We have all these nodes. They're physically connected uh, on some network and we have this single logical network that we get out of it. So here's our interfaces, here's our router, and we uh, sort of have this sort of send going into our application and our, uh, our send going into the, the mesh like this, right? Um, let's take a quick aside and let's look at in Go. This is the interface we get for UDP-like connections, the packet con, and here are the interesting methods. There's like a receive, a read from, and a send, a write to. Um, 
So it would be cool, I think, if we could build some kind of adapter that we could stick on top of the weave gossip thing and we get UDP semantics out on the other side. Um, if we do that, we can leverage a bunch of cool like Go standard library tooling. Um, we can actually model gossip as UDP. That's pretty neat too. Uh, it's also just kind of cool to be able to do that. So that's what we did. Uh, it's this thing called a MeshCon peer. It's not really relevant. It's just a, a translation layer. On top of that, we have this very thin layer that uh, transforms that uh, send and receive into channels of messages, because that's what we care about in Raft. So there's an incoming chan from the mesh network to our application, and an outgoing chan from our application to the mesh network. So that's our transport. We have these two chans. Looking nice. So far, so good. Uh, with this, we can start sketching out our, our sort of controller loop, our main driver. So the controller. Here's an excerpt from the example program again. Um, so we're going to kind of mirror this. We're going to have our ticker advancing, ticking the node. Um, we're going to be reading something from the ready, and we're going to do all these four steps. And then we have this quit thing down here at the bottom. Um, what does publish entries mean? That's kind of opaque. So uh, we can dive into the example code and see what this function looks like. Uh, unfortunately, you can't really read it. I'll go through it. What happens is we walk through all the entries that we've received, um, all normal, non-empty messages. So that's that first little arrow at the top. Get forwarded onto the commit chan. That means these entries have been committed and they need to be processed by the, the, the stateful store at some point. Um, that's the second arrow. All the conf change entries, that's a different type of entry, remember, it's configuration change. They get applied to the node directly. So that's that, that fourth arrow coming in there. Um, it's important to note that a conf change can have the effect of removing us from the cluster. Like, we can be kicked out of the cluster. That's totally valid. So we need to, in this function, somehow signal that happening and, and sort of tell our node to shut down. Uh, so that's that big red arrow. We need to have that control flow in there. Um, there's some other mechanical stuff, the little arrows. Um, I won't get into that. So here's our block. Um, and what's interesting here also is that if you remember this big block of text from the documentation, we see that each of these steps kind of maps directly to each one of these little pieces, and that's great. Um, let's make that more explicit. Let's have each of them be uh, um, private methods on the controller. And a couple of them have the effect of potentially booting us out of the cluster, so we need to account for that. And um, this brings us actually to the actual code that we have. So here's our um, ready save method. And we see um, we're invoking methods on the storage object, which we haven't gotten to yet. We can apply a snapshot. We can set a hard state. We can append entries into the storage. Uh, note that we're not persisting to disk here, which means we're kind of always ephemeral. Now, this could be problematic. Um, but it's fine as long as we're very careful to always, when, when we boot up, uh, assign ourselves a brand new ID, so like a, a UUID, basically, because in, RA, in uh, etcd, every unique identifier is assumed to be persistent like forever. It's assumed that when a RAF cluster sees a node come online that has uh, an ID that it already knows about, that the state of the node is corresponding to what it, the cluster already thinks its, its state should be. So if we don't have that, if we don't have persistence, then a node comes up with the same idea as it had before, but it's empty. That actually causes etcd to kind of hard crash. Um, that's fine in etcd. For us, it's not fine. So we just have to make sure we keep that invariant clean. Um, OK, fine. That's ready save. Then we have this ready send, which was um, analogous to the method we already saw. We're just pushing messages to the outgoing C. Remember, this is a channel that um, sends messages into the mesh network and to be distributed, consumed by other nodes. Um, yeah, there's some reporting of snapshots in case we get a snapshot. So far, so good. Here's our ready apply. Here's where we're going through all of the entries we received and doing different things with them. Um, some of them get pushed onto the uh, committed entry C. Uh, we do some special wrangling if there are conf changes. And finally, we have this ready advance method. It just exists for symmetry with the other ones. We're just advancing the internal state machine. 
So here's all of them collected with a bunch of commentary. I've collected it into its own um, uh, private method. And here I invoke that private method. And here's our complete control loop, actually. So we have our ticker at the top. We have our processing of the ready message in the middle. Um, we're reading uh, from the incoming C, and we're sending to the unreachable C. That we haven't talked about yet. So let's, uh, let's talk about those. The incoming C is from the transport. Um, it's what advances or steps the state machine. Uh, the unreachable C is something new. It indicates a remote node has failed to receive a message. So it's kind of like a, a control loop structure that uh, the etcd raft implementation can do something with. Um, maybe if something is unreachable for long enough, it's going to get auto-removed from the cluster in a, in a sense. So this is fine. Uh, but do you notice anything missing? There's, there's a couple of things that we don't have here. Um, we also need to read from our... Uh, entry or proposal channel and our conf change channel um, so that we can apply these states somewhere. And this actually needs to be a separate control loop. To be honest, I'm not totally sure why. Uh, it, it, it's like this in the real etcd server. I suspect there's some like deadlock condition in the RAF node that in the way it's been implemented that these need to be concurrent go routines or something. In any case, they just accept entries and they push them into the node. So now here's what our, our driver, our control structure has transformed into. Um, it's kind of big, right? I just started out trying to swap a transport, and now, now I have this thing. That's not, like, amazing, but okay, we're nearly there. Uh, just one more thing I need to point out. Um, what's this demuxer? I haven't talked about that at all. Well, uh, to explain this, I need to explain how conf changes work. In normal etcd, the user is going to add or remove nodes kind of explicitly. They're going to say, hey, this node is now part of the cluster. I'm taking this node away. But for us, remember, Mesh gives us this kind of like perfect knowledge of all of our peers. So it can tell us when a node has arrived or when a node has gone away. And when a node goes away, when it's no longer part of the Mesh, then by definition, since we're ephemeral, it's never coming back. So we can and should remove it from the cluster. So it's actually the Mesh that's going to be making these conf change proposals rather than um, any sort of user interaction. So let's make a drawing to kind of illustrate this. Here's our controller. It's driving our RAF node in the middle. Uh, here's our mesh con with our incoming and outgoing channels. Incoming C is driving the step method. That's wrapped by our sort of transport abstraction, and that in turn is connected to our router. OK, so far so good. Um, here's that unreachable C. So if you try to send a message on the outgoing channel and it doesn't work for whatever reason, we have to report that. This is kind of like a little feedback loop. And here's where we want the conf change stuff to come from the mesh router into the controller somehow. But now we have to think about this entry C. And it turns out that um, entries can be of two types according to this implementation of RAF. They can be a conf change or they can be like a normal entry. So these things require different behaviors. We have to kind of split them. And we want the conf change stuff to kind of go back towards uh, the router somehow. Remember, it's proposed commit. That's a model, right? So the mesh router is going to say, hey, uh, this node has gone away. You need to remove it from the cluster. That's a conf change proposal. And there's no real feedback mechanism to, to know when that's done, except to just kind of monitor. So we need, uh, in, in etcd, so we need some kind of stateful thing here to say, um, I've made the proposal, but it hasn't taken yet. The way we know when it's been taken is when the conf change uh, a proposal has been accepted, and that's what this little thing down here is. So we need to kind of send that back somehow so that we can close the loop. And in order to do that, we have this component. I just called it a membership, and it sort of creates another little feedback cycle. Um, so that's what you need the demuxer for. You need to split those conf change proposals over there. Normal entries are going to go to the state thing somehow. Uh, that's how the state gets populated. There's another way for the state to get populated with a snapshot. So that's snapshot. It's Basically, well, you know what snapshots are. And then there's some way for proposals to get added to the state machine, probably from some API. So there's proposals coming back this way. And that's basically our drawing. Um, if you prefer ASCII, this exists in the source code. Uh, same basic thing. OK, so here's all our channels. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This maps to all our channels. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Great. We have synchronicity. Uh, but now I've just introduced the state thing. What the heck is a state? Um, what does that mean? OK, let's talk about the state. 
So the state is where all this uh, etcd key value stuff exists. It sort of lives. Um, so you can envision etcd as like all this raft mechanical stuff that I've been describing over here in this big cloud. And then what you care about is the state, right? Um, in order to interact with the state, we probably want some kind of API. Um, and since we're building this brand new and etcd v3 is a new hotness, we can say, to heck with legacy, let's just stick the etcd v3 API in there. And so now we've done all this work, and now it's like, it's like time to build up this brand new API that's like constantly under revision. I guess it's in beta now, but it's still going to change. I'm tired, man. I'm really tired. OK, so let's, let's just do the KV API. Um, that's enough for now. Uh, there's actually a lot of different like, sub-APIs in the V3 API. Um, there's, I think, six as of right now. But let's just do KV server. This is what KV server is. It has five methods. Uh, the methods take gRPC um, types, range and put and delete and transaction and compact. So we can implement these. Uh, let's look quickly at the v3 implementation of the real etcd server just to see how that feels. And here we see the put method. It's five lines. That's great. But really, that's just because it delegates to this kind of global uh, process internal raft request method. That's a bit bigger. but we see this important line here, or I see, maybe you don't see. Uh, all it does is say, uh, propose this message. And that makes sense, because if we look at our diagram again, there's our proposals, right? So we've proposed that method. This lines up. So we can duplicate this. Mine's a little bit longer, because I handle some con context stuff a little bit different. So we're duplicating. Here's the range method. And we have the same structure. We're sending it all to this like um, kind of big internal uh, uh, yeah internal raft request method. Uh, all of these methods kind of have the same structure to them. We're always proposing this type and then waiting for a response to the proposal back. Here's put. Here's delete. Here's transaction, which we need. And remember, we're like ephemeral. And this is kind of a prototype code. So here's a compact, not implemented. And I, OK, fine. Um, OK, so I think I have a couple of minutes. Um, I'd like to do a demo, if I can. Let's see if I can prove to you that this all kind of works. Uh, give me a second. I will mirror my displays. So here we have some machines in the cloud, uh, A, B, and C. OK, I've started up all of those machines. And um, they're running. And they've formed a cluster. I guess you'll have to take my word for it. How do we interact with an etcd v3 server? There's an etcd control um, command line tool. And you have to give it this special little prefix, um, this little environment variable. And then we can say get from A to Z. OK, it's an empty cluster, so there's nothing in there. Let's do uh, put foo123. OK, get from A to Z. Aha. We've been programming for like weeks, and we can set a value and return a value. Great. Um, OK, so what I want to demonstrate here, uh, let's just do another put, 456. OK, is it still there? Great. Um, this is what's kind of neat. I'm going to start a new uh, uh, member in the cluster. It's going to connect to the other peers through mesh, but it's not going to explicitly interact with etcd at all. Uh, and hopefully, everything's going to sort of line up. Um, here I'm starting it. Note, I'm only giving it a single peer. I'm only telling it about one other member of the, of the gossip cluster. And the router is going to take care to like tell everybody about it. Um, what's happened in the background is the node has joined the cluster. It's received the stream of updates, the stream of two messages, uh, two entries that I've pushed. And now it should be uh, up to date. And we can check that by getting against it. Uh, Get A to Z. Should we see foo456? Yes. OK. It works, in theory. In practice, it's, it's real. It kind of does what it says on the tin. OK. Just a moment. I will unmirror my displays. How do I do that over here? Great. Great. OK. That was a lot of work. Um, conclusion and next steps. Uh, I can't say that this was a great idea. Um, 
to do something conceptually simple, it seemed to take quite a lot of work. I mean, you can't look at this diagram and not kind of have this reaction, right? Like, all I wanted to do was swap out a little bit at the bottom, and I had to do all this. Um, so, like, in theory, this is all possible. Uh, but it may be that the, this project may exist just to serve as kind of a warning to others. If you want to, like, change the core, like, fundamental, it seems to me that HTTP is a pretty fundamental thing to, uh, to etcd. Previously it was regular HTTP, now it's HTTP2 with the gRPC and the authentication and all that built in. Um, so like, it kind of works, uh, it can be made to work, but maybe this isn't the best idea, I don't know. Um, if you want to take a look, uh, here it is. Uh, GitHub, Weaveworks Mesh, it's all open source. Uh, Mesh is the library and then we have this little uh, MetCD is how I call it. It's a library that you can import. You can um, do all this stuff yourself, and you can look at it as a reference if you want to do this kind of work yourself. Um, and I think that puts me right on time. So thanks for listening. I'll be at the bar. <laughs> and if anyone wants to. Hello? Perfect. All right. Yeah, we can do one question before coffee. Does anyone have a good question? I see one. Uh, hey, my name is Anton. And why you need uh, a wait? For, you say when you distributed information about cluster changes, why you need to wait uh, for a proposal that proposal really changes? Because if you want to disconnect node, you, okay, you don't send to this node anymore. And like, it, everybody in the cluster will eventually know that node should be disconnected. Yeah, um, it's kind of built into the raft paper that uh, you need to, so a raft is a collection of n nodes, and in order for uh, you to ha adv have advancement, in order for you to advance the state of the replicated log, you need to achieve quorum with every write, and quorum is defined as 51% of the nodes. So if a node just drops away, then you can only achieve like uh, four out of five, and if another node drops away, you can only achieve three out of five. And so at some point, you do need to tell Raft that the size of this cluster is gone from five to four. And the way you communicate that kind of information in Raft is by pushing it through the replicated log, same as any other piece of information. So to the, the information that the cluster has changed size needs to be uh, committed and accepted by all members of the cluster, same as like the value of foo is one, two, three. So you, you, you need to do it. Uh, it's kind of, I guess, originally it was underspecified in the paper, and now, like, I guess there are pretty well-established ways of doing it. But yeah, that's why you, why you have to do it, I guess. Why do you have to read the Why I have to read? What do you mean? Read the changes. Why do you have to confirm the changes? Confirm, I mean, it's... Because there's no guarantee that when you push a message into the cluster that all the nodes have, re have received it. You have to have this, um, you have to have this like propose and commit uh, cycle in order to ensure that what you think has happened has actually been accepted by all the nodes in the cluster. And it's the same for any other write through, it's, it's just modeled as a write through the replicated log. We can talk offline if that doesn't answer the question, but yeah, that's, a, that's the model. Okay. Um, I think I'm over time, so I'll be around. Thanks again.